our mobile phones continue changing our world. And today we're talking to retailers or uh, uh, Pulsate about how the retail world is about to shift because of beacons and because of modern, modern smartphones. We're gonna see them right now. Who are you? So I'm Patrick Leddy, I'm the CEO of Paul Tate. Uh, first of all, just to give you a bit of background uh, on myself, I previously ran a company called Furious Tribe. It was a mobile strategy and development company. So we helped some of the biggest and most demanding companies in the world to do mobile loyalty programs, geofencing and survey apps. So our experience is really in doing custom consultancy and um, bespoke app builds, uh, content management systems and, and push notification. And I guess out of that experience in working with various apps and different companies around the world, we were using some of our competitor products, different tools, and that kind of moved us in a new way to look at building a product infrastructure rather than working on an ad hoc basis for each, each client. And that's how Pulsate was born. Very cool. You know, the mobile phone is really changing uh, what software is possible uh, over, let's say, a laptop. Because a laptop is really designed to sit on a desk, sort of like what yours is sitting there where you know, this thing goes with me everywhere and uh, that's changing retail. Right? Sure, well I think um, you know, your, the mobile device and increasingly wearables also are becoming you know, aware of the world around themselves, helping you understand yourself better and quantify yourself better. And we think that's a great opportunity for brands and for companies to also understand that information to become much more seamless, much more integrated and considered with their communications. And that's why we've built Pulsate. So Pulsite is a all-in-one context marketing platform that helps brands really engage with their customers. So at the moment, our sweet spot customer is retailers. So we help retailers to increase their revenue by bringing more people into the business and having them increase their basket size and ultimately buy more while they're there. So the way we achieve this is through three main components. We have a mobile SDK or API, and it's you know, really easy to drop it into any existing app that's there. It's a static lib, it goes into your Android or existing iPhone app. And then it starts to communicate back with the Pulsate cloud platform. The third component is the ability to add sensors. And the first sensor that you can add with Pulsate is a Bluetooth low energy beacon. Now you can bring any beacon that you like. We're like totally open, so you can bring in, you know, there's a number of beacons out yeah, there. Most retailers still have no clue what a beacon is. Absolutely. Because yeah, I give a lot of talks and most of my uh, people, most of the audience members have no right. idea what a, so what is a beacon? So a beacon is a device that basically, you know, it's, it's very, very simple. It spits a number out into the air. Uh, the beacon actually spits three numbers. In it spits three numbers into the air. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, you're, you're, you're quite right. But it's like, you know, the, a lot of people think that they're being tracked by these beacons that, you know, it can see their phone, it can seal their personal data. I think a great analogy to use is a beacon yeah. is a lighthouse and the ships are the, the mobile device. Yeah, I actually have one on my uh, key ring and it's, right now it's spitting these three numbers in the air and my absolutely. phone can tell how close it is to this thing, right? Sure, so you go out of a certain range, you get an alert telling you your keys have, have gone missing. So, you know, a beacon is, is, is a very, a uh, small primitive piece of technology, but I mean, once implemented with the right set of services around it, that's when it becomes a little bit more interesting. I think the, the world has gone a bit beacon crazy at the moment, there's a lot of hype. And I think one of the biggest um, points that people misunderstand is they mistake uh, presence for context. So they think that someone being close that you really understand their context. I'm not so sure that, that that is true. And I mean, I'll give you a great example. So you're shopping with your, your wife or your, your girlfriend and you walk into the ladies shoe wear department and you get a piece of content pushed to your device. But of course, you're not in the market for that content. You just happen to be passing by. So just because you've gone past the beacon doesn't really mean that you should have got that content. So things become much more interesting when we get at your, your interests, your behaviors, your past purchases, your gender, your age, and then we mash that up with uh, either micro or macro location to get a much better, better piece for, for who you are and where you are and ultimately what defines you as a person. And we think that is true context. Now, th this is sort of interesting because uh, the privacy people are like, well, you just said I ha have to give my gender, my age, my location, and a few other things, right? Probably yeah. my Facebook friend list and then sure. my Facebook interest list over to you okay. just so you can uh, better push a coupon to me at the grocery store. Uh, um, and that's sort of, if it's framed that way, it's mm -hmm. like, who would do that? But 
I think there's deep utility coming. I, give me a sense of some of the utility that you will get if you uh, opt into some of these new shopping store apps that are yeah. going to uh, know where you are uh, along with who you are. Sure. I think that's a, that's a great question. And I mean, as you, you framed it in the age of context, how do you cross the, the freaky line? I think a great way to do that is to demonstrate what the, the, the win-win is, what the value is that the end user gets basically by opting into this. So with Pulsate, um, all of this data, and I can give you a, yeah, a let's quick see demo. A demo. Yeah, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll jump in. So uh, this is the website when you log in as the retailer. This is the interface that you would see. So the, this is a retailer, this is not a shopper. Exactly. A, a shopper uh, would, would get, uh, well, yeah. first of all, you guys uh, just closed some deals, didn't you? We did actually, so we so signed what's, up. So what's um, some of the retailers that are using your technology underneath? Sure, so we're live eight weeks. Where we've signed up immediately upon a launch, Coors Light and also Selfridges. So they're one of the biggest uh, department stores in the UK. So we're really excited about that. A couple of other brands coming on board that we can't mention just yet, but in a couple of weeks we will be able to announce that. Okay. Um, so yeah. The, so this is the the site that the retailers see. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So it's actually seamless um, for the end user. The, the consumer doesn't see anything. So they would see like you know the the Macy's mobile app as it exists in its present form, it's unchanged. Think of Pulsate as like the, the Google Analytics tracking code in the app, then the, the retailer logs in here where they can actually see the, the end customer. Now some of the profiles are, are gonna be anonymous and that they will be the users, for example, that haven't opted in. So you have to um, explicitly in your privacy policy, you have to you know, say what you're doing, you have to ask the user for their location, the, the, to push and also to connect their, their social accounts. So now would I see this person if they walked in the front door? Like if I had an iPad at the front door yes. and I was a customer service person, Absolutely. could I make it so that the this person's profile popped up because they had the Macy's app or a retailer's app yeah. on there? Well, your your way as always, your way ahead of us. And um, so that we haven't quite delivered that yet, okay. but we are talking to a major department store. Um, of implementing a personal shopper iPad app. So the personal shopper gets access to, we say, Robert has just walked in and your photograph pops up, things that you've previously purchased, and almost like put you on a radar. So to turn your device into the beacon and actually flip the model on its head, so we can go and locate you in the store and give you a much more personalized, integrated service. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what are we seeing here? So this is an individual profile. So at an aggregate level, you can see, and here's some of the users, for example, that haven't opted in. Um, I can see the existing segments that are in Pulsate. So users that are disengaged, the ones that are maybe about to churn to a competitor, the ones who are really engaged with their brand. So the way it works is you go in and, and build a new segment in Pulsate. So you can ask questions like, you know, show me users that were active in you know, less than 30 days who have been at um, one of our beacons uh, more than 30 days ago. So this could be a, you know, a user that is about to you know, become really disengaged with the brand. So you could create a geofence in Pulsate and uh, Pulsate does two types of a location. We do the micro location with the beacons. As I said, you can bring the beacons into the platform, but they're not very good at bringing people into your store in the first place. So the geofencing, which is hardware independent, it just runs on the phone's sensors, the cellular modem, the Wi-Fi sensing. You can draw a virtual perimeter and then when someone walks through that perimeter, that belongs in the disengaged segment, we can say, Robert, we haven't seen you in 30 days. You know, we've really missed you. Here, come in for a complimentary coffee and 5% off all items. So we recapture you and we move you from the disengaged segment to the engaged segment. And that's something that's really important for retailers. But you can ask all sorts of questions in this, such as, for example, what's, how socially influential someone might be. You can also pull data in directly from the CRM, such as, um, what loyalty level this person is at, how many points they have on their card. So if someone comes into the store and then leaves abruptly, you can remind them that they have credits on their card available for, for redemption. Very, very granular. Um, you, there's all sorts of possible use cases. But I mean, predominantly you wanna separate the engaged from the disengaged, the people that like X from Y. And that's, I think, where we get to get you know, truly contextual, not just relying on geospatial characteristics, but also the behavioral characteristics, how loyal or disloyal a customer is. You can actually geofence your competitors' locations as well, which is an interesting one. So you can see, well, which one of your loyal customers also frequents a competitor's location. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. So let's say, for example, um, you have the AT&T mobile app. So you're an AT&T customer, and your plan is about to expire in 30 days. So you're, you know, you're at risk of churning to Verizon, for as an example. So you, they could geofence all of the Verizon stores, so they know that. Robert has gone into a Verizon store in the last 30 days. He hasn't come into one of our stores and his plan also expires. 
So we could geofence all of the AT&T stores, combine that segment rule and make you a very uh, targeted offer when you walk by one of your, your own stores to come in and to get a much better deal, to get an upgrade and to stay with the Or you might even ask a question like, uh, are you looking at an Android phone or an iPhone, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Or are you going to yeah. wait for the iPhone 6? <laughs> you know, something <laughs> like because that's probably why I'm like looking at the stores right now is trying yeah. to figure out which plans to buy when I sure. when I do buy my iPhone 6, uh, you know, should I switch over to something else, right? Yeah. So that that uh, segment rule might something lo might look something like this. So you might say, well, show me people who their contract expires in less than let's say 30 days where also they might have not been in the store. So we say events, they haven't been at one of our beacons. So we'll say that this beacon here, for example, is inside the store more than 30 minutes ago, change that to days. And then we can also say from the data that's actually piped in from the app or the CRM, show me people where they're plan level or their upgrade eligibility so they could get the iPhone 6, right, is actually set to true. So we can save that as a segment and then we can actually go and engage against that segment with our campaign builder. And this allows you to design a targeted offer, an in-store experience that is based on your proximity or your presence to let's say a beacon, but also based on you having an upgrade eligibility on, on your plan. You're, you, know, you can get the iPhone 6, you've been spending a lot of money with them, and they also know you've been kind of sniffing out competitors, so they really want to make you a compelling offer. Um, so here's a, a template. So this is uh, how, like at a grocery store, Coors, I, I'm predicting, is using this. If you stop at the uh, uh, chip aisle, <laughs> well, I know yeah. you're having a party. <laughs> sure. So now I can put an ad there saying, hey, if you buy a, a six-pack yeah. of Coors or a 12-pack of Coors for your party because you just bought some chips, that's an obvious uh, thing, and maybe yeah. I'll give you a dollar off of both together. Absolutely, right? and that's a, that, that's a great use case for, for Coors. Because I want you yeah. to go from the chip aisle all the way over to the, to the beer aisle and yeah. buy Coors, you know, and now I sort of put it in your head, maybe I should have Coors instead of Bud, Budweiser. Or something. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I'm not in any of those market segments, but I could guess. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with Coors, we've actually, and that's a great use case, but we put yeah. beacons into over 200 bars. So as part of the point of sale material that they give the, the bar owner, a beacon it now packs with that. So they're running a campaign at the moment, um, and basically it's a, it's a Coors-like game. And based on playing the game and you earn points based on how far you actually get, you get free pints push your device. But now when you walk into a bar and you have the app enabled, you get a free pint of Coors Light pushed instantly to your device. Because you know the first pint that you drink, if it's Coors Light, you're probably gonna stay drinking uh, Coors Light. Yeah. And another thing that we do is if we push you a pint or you earn one in the game and you don't redeem it, we're able to create virtual perimeters only on Saturday evenings around the bars that then invite you in to go and redeem your pint and actually to drink and enjoy it. So that's just like yeah. one example of how Coors Light are using the technology already uh, to, to great advantage. Interesting. Uh, my brother owns a bar, so he'd probably want to, uh, after you start buying Coors Light, uh, uh, you know, put on your calendar all of the uh, bands that are going to play in the next uh, month there, you know, because yeah. that'll get you back to the bar. Sure. There's, so, like, there's so many things that you, so many things that you could do. Uh, yeah. So what, we, what we've kind of realized in the market is, you know, you've got guys that are doing beacons and producing the hardware and that's very much commoditized and, you know, without segmentation yeah. and SDKs, it doesn't really, doesn't really do anything. So we've been trying to kind of figure out with Pulse8, what comes next. Now, so, do you sell beacons as well as part of your offering? We do, we or do. Or do you just say, go to uh, Gimbal, you know, the Gimbal uh, Qualcomm spin out and buy the beacons from them or sure. buy them from Estimotes, which is yeah. right here, or whatnot. So we actually don't care where you, where you get your beacons because we don't hang our hat on beacons. We think, you know, they're, they're, they're commoditized already. It's, um, you know, it's only gonna be a matter of time before everyone is producing beacons. The real value uh, in proximity marketing and context marketing is around the analytics and the engine that sits on the cloud that makes it the decisions, the deep customer insights. So while we sell our own beacons, you can just bring your own beacons as well. You, we're, we're not that interested in being a beacon, you, beacon company. Yeah. If you're on an iPhone, you, you are and I am, we could turn on be beacons in the iPhone. This is only true for Apple products so far. Sure. Um, are you thinking of that? Because if we're drinking every Friday night together, uh, our beacons could be sensing that. 
and could be reporting it to a shopping app like this as well and saying, yeah. oh, now we need two Coors Lights. Sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's even dating implications as well for being well, in, for being in this bars is San Francisco, and two people being in bars. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so are you thinking about doing those those sure. in phone beacons as well instead of yes. just a beacon on a wall that we, tells when I'm close to the wall or whatever? We've, we've actually, we've built that already. It's very, very easy to do, uh, to turn a, an end user's phone into a beacon when they request help in one of the stores. Okay. It's just literally one line of code that you need to write, like let's say for, for iOS and the same for Android, that will turn the device into the beacon. Yeah. What we're actually experimenting with as well with is the ability to change your beacons over the air through our cloud platform. So with the beacon at the moment, you know, when you provision it, you have to pair over Bluetooth with your phone right beside it just to change the antenna or the advertising packet or one of those things. But what we're looking at doing is actually changing it remotely on the fly through the cloud platform. So if you change one of the attributes, if you have an iPad in the store, it can then receive the updates from the cloud and pair systematically with, with each beacon and change it and update it oh, in, cool. in, in real time. Yeah. How much does this cost a retailer? I mean, if, you know, if I... If, take my brother's bar if he wants to buy this and put it into his own app, how much sure. would that cost? It's very easy to get started. So it's uh, six cents US um, per user per month. Um, and it's free up to 10,000 end users. So you can actually just try it out. Um, you can see how it goes. There's no like upfront costs. You can buy the beacons from us. They're about $10 per beacon. We're looking at bringing that cost way down. Or you can just go and you know buy beacons from, for someone, from someone else. Uh, one of the reasons that we actually developed our own beacons is we didn't want to wait around for other companies to solve their production uh, bottlenecks and problems with their beacons, so we just went ahead and, and, and built our own. Very cool. Um, so six cents a person per month. Um, what else should we see uh, that, sure. that the retailer might be able to do in this new world where mobile phone users are walking in and there's beacons on the wall or in the displays, right? Sure. Cause Eventually, we're going to have a beacon underneath a lot of product categories. You know, if if you're in the men's shoe yeah. department, you're going to have a beacon there. So everybody who walks close to that is uh, going to be the system's going to know you're there, right? Sure. And one of the big problems, I even if you take iOS as an example, that is beacon ranging. So knowing with a great deal of accuracy that you are beside a beacon, that only works when the when the screen is turned on, illuminated, or the app is open. So in the background, that doesn't work at all. Now, a great way of getting around that is actually taking a beacon and uh, reducing the power output to the antenna. So it emits a, you know, a field that's about half a meter to a meter and then positioning these beside specific product groupings. So as you stand beside a product, you can get information pushed about the industrial design inspiration behind it, the material it's made out of reviews or complementary products to that. We're even looking at, you know, if you've looked at that product online and you have that retailer's app, it could remind you about the product you looked at online as you walk by it in the real world or, or you know, the, the other way around. If you look at that product and pick it up in the real world, the next time you check out online, that's one of the recommended products. So that's another potential yeah, yeah. Uh, use case as well. Or even give uh, shipping, you know, maybe you want to, uh, like if you're buying a refrigerator, you know, and yeah. you're uh, looking at your phone and you're using the, the Macy's app or whatever, um, maybe it tells you all about shipping opportunities or, yeah. hey, would you like to get this delivered right now? And yeah. if you say yes, uh, without having a salesperson come over, you'll save 10 bucks, you know, something yeah. like that. I don't know, that, I, that's you can a, play that's lots a, of that, games. That, there's, there's so many use cases. I mean, we haven't even figured them all out yet. There are thousands of potential things. Because that way I, it keeps people from going to Amazon and getting something cheaper shipped to their house, right? Absolutely, showrooming. That's one of the main uh, pain points of, of retailers that we're looking to uh, eliminate, to give them control, to own the user experience, to own the app, and to help them reach out and engage their customers and really evangelize those customers to stop them showrooming, to get them back in and, and, and to get them buying. Yeah. What are we seeing here? Yeah, so this is our campaign builder here and this allows you to, first of all, design the push notification uh, that would go to the device. Uh, people really engage. Can you, yeah. there we go. All right, so what, what are we? What are we seeing here? So this is our campaign builder, and this allows you to visualize the in-store experience that you're about to actually send out to those customers. So here you can design your, your push notification. So you can see that we do uh, merge tags here. So this will dynamically replace everyone's name in. So this is going to make it more personalized as it goes out to them instead of, hey there, uh, and, and being more generic. And you can see here over in the right-hand side that we can see over iOS, at various iOS and Android screens, the truncation limit 
uh, differs on screen to screen. So we can see, you know, is everyone getting in the initial pop-up that all important message? And then as you scroll down, you get to decide the rich media content that you actually want to send that customer. So we have a number of templates there, but this could play host to anything. It could be an announcement. Maybe you're running an event. So one of the use cases would be, let's say, you know, for a retailer, you're having a VIP fashion event and you only want your most engaged and socially influential customers to come. So you could build a segment that targets the most socially influ influential users and the ones who have been recently in the store, recent and recently in the app, to get them coming to the event, tweeting and putting up comments on Facebook about your, your brand and your content. So inside the campaign builder, um, you can design, as I said, the, an event invite, a survey, an offer, information about um, a company. And I just want to send you, uh, show you here a template that we did very quickly just for, for Vodafone. And this just shows you one of the examples here that when you're inside the store, this could prompt you to upgrade your device based on the one that you're actually looking at in real time. And then further down, this uh, in-app inbox allows you to define the content of what you see here. So our SDK also has an, like a wallet that all of the communication sits inside. And this is great. I mean, you, know, you can go back and actually see what you're previously sent, the offers that you were sent in store, the communication that you were sent in store. But customers can actually reply to this as well. So this is not just one way. And inside here, uh, the next section, you'll see that you can actually go and reply in real time to that customer. So you start to develop this uh, relationship with the customer one-on-one, -on -one, and it doesn't yeah. just come from, like, let's say, Macy's. It comes from the person in there that's dealing with you, and you're trying to build rapport with the customer to address their concerns, the feedback that they might have. So a bar could use this. You walk in the bar, and now my brother could be... Uh Oh, you know, somebody just why? Oh, yeah, you're over there. You know, absolutely. Over. Yeah. Or uh, if it's a big bar, maybe you answer back and say, "I'll be over there in five minutes." You know, because maybe he's back working in the kitchen and not yeah. dealing dealing with customers out front. You know? Absolutely, and you know, it might save your you know customers jumping onto Twitter and getting you know pretty angry and that being being public. Where if they can raise a complaint or a negative some kind of review that they have about the company and get that dealt with in a timely fashion that really preserves the, the brand and the image. Can you, uh, you know, uh, you just brought up complaints. I immediately thought of the United Airlines, which is sort of funny. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, could yeah. you grab any co customer data and uh, apply that to the email so that you know a little bit more? Like a, a United Airlines thing would be, uh, your fl flights are uh, running four hours late at SFO. Well, maybe if you could grab the uh, flight number and yeah. put it in there. Now your response back is like, oh, I'm sorry. I just talked to the pilot of UA593 and we're in a holding pattern because of fog and there's not much we can do. Sorry about yeah. that. Or maybe, uh, you know, come out and see us and we'll uh, give you a cookie or something. <laughs> you know? yeah. I, mean, I, I had a very similar situation that I'd actually, it's uh, scary, the resemblance. But we haven't got to that level quite yet. Okay. And what we are doing is when negative reviews are left on the app store against that app, we can actually link it back to the, it. the user's profile. So you can go back and, you know, attempt to follow that issue up with the, with the customer and resolve it. That's an interesting use case, though, about being, being able to grab it from social media and somehow compare it to an in-app user. I'm not sure technically how we would do that quite yet, but I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get to it eventually. More, more data to import, right? Yeah. Some of the, the targeting here is interesting. Um, so what I talked about before in terms of, you know, someone's near a beacon, send them an offer, which is not contextual. So here we can target a beacon, sure. So we can say, let's say, for example, we want when someone comes in range of this particular beacon, uh, which might be on the front door or yeah. something. Which okay. could, be on, could be on the front door. And then we'd say, well, look, we, when you come in with an, an immediate touching distance to this beacon, we want you to get content. And that's kind of like, that's been done before. So we offer the ability to combine with a segment rule. So you can say, well, look, it's only the disengaged segment. Or it might be, um, you know, the world, physically world, physical world disengaged. So they're very engaged within the app, but they haven't come into the store. And we want to combine it when they come in with this beacon, with inside this area, that then we send them a push notification. But you yeah. could also say a geofence. You could say, you know, it's about someone um, from the about to churn segment with the geofence that is around uh, the Vodafone store. Yeah. So that's how you compare the two different um, functions. And for building geofences, that's really simple too. So um, you can, let me just bring this up. For geofences, we just have a Google map and you can add a geofence to the map. You can adjust its perimeter. 
yeah. specify whether it's like an on entry or on exit event and then we synchronize these down to the mobile application there's no practical upper limit for the amount of fences that we can do so both at a macro and at a micro level you can sense customers locations you can also understand what they previously purchased how engaged they are and it's by combining these where they are and who they are that you can be much more contextual in your commu communication much more seamless you know uh, we talk about this in the book if you're uh, at napa there's 450 wineries and people are driving around them you know uh, and they hit three a day or something like that are you able to see their uh history sure. if, the, if you put a geofence around each of these wineries or whatnot that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. So we yeah. have a analytics module that allows you to see the number of impressions that your campaigns are getting. So it'll, it'll show the effectiveness. You can split test them. You can see what's working in store and what's not. But you can also see the impressions that your beacons or geofences are getting, regardless of whether you actually do a, a push event off the, off the back of that. And we've great stats here. As so you can see, uh, you can break it down by beacon, break it down by campaign or time range that gives you a full overview on exactly what's happening. Wow. You touched on something else there that, though that's interesting, and it's like, what if you, walk, if you drove past or drove through uh, four or five geofences, would you get four or five pushes? And not a lot of people have really thought about the implications, user experience uh, implications of that. Yeah, so. I assume you won't because, uh, first of all, retailers are fairly conservative. And if they piss off their customers, that, that'll turn into a negative. You yeah. know, you don't want to piss people off. So you, you don't want to shove a lot of data into uh, the phone notification uh, without uh, reason to do that. But mm -hmm. I, if you go to uh, Camus, for instance, in Napa, and I, let's say I own Paradox. Paradox is $40 a bottle. Camus is $200 a bottle. Well, that's quite different than if you visited Sutter Home first. Sure. And that's 10 to $20 a bottle, right? So you, when you come to my place, if I know your history, I know a lot about what kind of customer you're going to be. You know, are you a big wine buyer? Are you very discriminating? Because I can tell the kinds of wine places you chose yeah. before coming to my place who you are. Sure, and that's one of the way that ways that we infer interests. You know, if we can't get at your Facebook likes or you haven't opted into that, we'll know the various premises and interests that you visited and that we can use that to build up a better picture for who you are by in, in varying interests off the back of that or by looking at the other apps that are on the mobile device and building some kind of a profile for the category of apps that are there we wouldn't actually take the data back up to the cloud platform and specifically what apps yeah. we're able to build a metadata based on categorization no, that's cool um, um, tell me a little bit about your company because I, I think the product's pretty interesting I, and retailers will you know, if they want this, they're going to spend a lot more time looking at you. We're just giving them a little taste of what, what is possible. Tell me, uh, how are you funded? And uh, you said you were bootstrapped, right? We're bootstrapped, yeah, completely bootstrapped. How do you do that? Uh, <laughs> with great difficulty. Um, so, yeah, the, a bunch back, of credit cards, right? the background <laughs> is... Uh, <laughs> The background is uh, I set up a company in 2010 called Furious Tribe, which is an app development company. We did it out of college with a couple of other guys. We went very quickly to you know over a million dollars in turnover, profitable, and we ran that for a number of years. We had great experience building apps like Citibank World Privileges, O2 Telefonica Treats, one of the biggest loyalty programs in Europe, and we were the kind of guys behind designing and architecting um, those services. So that was a natural progression to lead into Pulsate. Yeah. So what we've done basically is taken the, uh, the revenue that we've earned out of our professional services company and we've built the product out of that revenue. It's been very difficult uh, to go and do that. We did get a small research and development grant from the Irish government because some of this technology that we've created is new, but we're now at the point where we're live, we've got customers and we're looking for investment. So yeah. we're in the process of talking to several uh, investors here in the United States and indeed in Europe to take the product that we've built at the next level. So we've Very got cool. a, a big ambition for where we want to take it. Very so cool. it's uh, interesting to see what comes next. Where do retailers, if they're interested in this, where they find you? It's uh, pulsatehq.com. You can find out everything that you need to know uh, on Twitter as well. We've kept it simple, pulsatehq as well. Very cool. Thank you so much. Thanks, Robert. Cheers. Thanks.